My name is David Bookbinder. I'm a special researcher on Chad and Sudan Human Rights Watch. And I've been uh, doing research mostly in Eastern Chad, but also in West Darfur um, since January 2006. Basically doing research on human rights abuses and writing reports and then doing advocacy. That's the basic job. So starting in January 2006, I went to uh, the southeastern Chad uh, in the area known as Darsila. And I went hugging the border, a stretch of the border, documenting recent cross-border attacks against villages in eastern Chad. So there was a lot of cross-border movements of militia groups that were going from Darfur into eastern Chad, attacking villages, basically for the mo with motive of, apparently, cattle theft, right? So they would go to villages, take the cattle, and kill those who, re those who resisted. So I documented that. Some of that would, ex would uh, in some instances, there were many people killed. Usually there were two to five, 10, 12, small numbers of people killed. Um, that was a, that is a pattern of violence that has um, evolved with time. Um, but one thing that is um, you know, important about that is that there was an ethnic pattern to the violence. So generally it was non-Arab villages that were being attacked. And generally victims identified their attackers as Arabs. So that, that was, that's, that's a piece of, of research that was the, the sort of the kernel for my you know, subsequent research on, uh, on what's been happening there. Um, where that evolved was that incursions would go deeper into Chad, right? So you would have armed incursions maybe 60, 80 kilometers from the Chad Sudan border. And you would also have victims of violence reporting that not only were there Sudanese militias coming across the border and attacking them, but there are also Chadians, um, people they knew, people they grew up with, appearing uh, with these militias and, um, and participating in the violence. So, but again, there's an ethnic pattern where typically it's uh, non-Arab villages that are being attacked by mostly uh, Arab militias, but you know, that does not really quite encapsulate the dynamic because the militias are not monolithic. And included among the, the so-called Arab militias are non-Arabs, even members of the very communities that are being attacked. So there's a, there's a complexity to the, the violence that you know is I think needs to be understood um, to uh, to really to properly talk about it. But it does get complicated. Um, more recently, I've been uh, looking at the Chadian government response to some of this violence. Um, Chadian government Chad is fighting a civil war. There are Chadian rebels that are based in Darfur, and those Chadian rebels are supported by the government of Sudan. So, uh, in, and in turn, the Chadian government has been supporting rebels, Sudanese rebels, in Darfur. So there's a proxy war. So the governments of Chad and Sudan are backing armed proxies, mostly based in Darfur, and that is having a you know, very important impact on these on the, on sort of a uh, local level violence, where. One thing that the Chadian government has done um, in response to this sort of threat of, uh, you know, of, of insurgency, of these insurgents, is that they have redeployed their border forces and they have hardened certain strategic towns, and that has left a security vacuum, right? So they have evacuated border garrisons in order to defend you know, strategic points along the border, and into this power vacuum have. There, there have been lots of you know, increased incursions from Darfur of these militia groups. So the Chadian government has not has sort of prioritized um, uh, you know, uh, fighting against the, uh, its uh, insurgents over protecting its civilians. So that's been a major problem. Um, and uh, part of what I've been looking at more is, is ways in which the uh, Chadian government has been um, attempting to uh, arm civilian groups in eastern Chad, um, sort of self-protection force, they call them, you know, the Groupe de Alta Defense. And that's a, a new problem that is ex potentially ex extremely explosive because typically what happens is, as, you know, as I said earlier, there is an ethnic pattern to the violence where it's generally, non, generally Arab militias attacking non-Arabs. So what's been happening is the Chad government has been funneling weapons to these non-Arab self-defense forces. So that, that sort of furnishing weapons along an ethnic 
divide in an area where there's been communal violence is ex potentially extremely dangerous because obviously you are increasing the potential lethality of the conflict as you are putting weapons of war. These are Kalashnikovs, you know, automatic weapons, into areas where there had been, you know, basically conflict had been fought with primitive implements such as you know, clubs and bows and arrows and spears. So you, you get also the potential for retaliatory attacks against Arab civilians, which is something that's been happening, which is something I've been documenting. So you have backlash violence against Arabs. That widens the cycle of violence. And the fact that this violence is now being committed with weapons of war also overwhelms the traditional conflict resolution structures that have existed that historically have you know, succeeded more or less with resolving these problems. So if you kill a person, you are obliged to pay Blood money, the dia. The dia is 100 camels, right? So that's great. You pay 100 camels, you are, you know, you're absolved, that you're indemnified. People move on. But what happens when you kill 220 people, right? Or 400 people? There's no way you can pay that many camels. So the the, the the fact that there are now automatic weapons, you know, fueling this conflict means that there's no way that the traditional conflict resolution structures can can deal with them. So they overwhelm that. And, and that's when you, you get the, the risk of a, a extreme of a mass killings. Um, when did this start and what can you do you think there was like a motivating um, factor that, that made this start when it did? Where did it emerge out of? Well, this, you know, the, the Chad Sudan border is a uh, questionable concept, right? Uh, I mean, to uh, something like the United Nations, obviously, the Chad Sudan border is. Very clear, you can't cross it. You know, obviously, they've had trouble uh, getting the United Nations into Darfur. Um, but for some of these local groups, it's just a dry riverbed, and uh, so a lot of um, and a lot of these uh, a lot of the people who live on either side of the Chad Sudan border have uh, it, it, trouble reconciling their national identity, either as Chadian or as Sudanese, versus their more local identity, either as part of an ethnic group or as part of a, a kingdom that predates. These borders, such as Darsila. Darsila is a cross-border kingdom. Dar Zagawa is a cross-border kingdom. Dar Masali. So these are all traditional homelands of ethnic groups that straddle the Chad Sudan border. So you have ethnic groups that are, you know, occur on, on both sides of the border. So um, w w with this extreme uh, permeability of the border, there have just there's a long history of cross-border violence. There's no you can't say that. These attacks start at any time because it's, I don't see how you could put a date on the beginning of this. However, you can say when things, uh, when there was this tremendous increase in violence. And, and, and in my mind, to my, in my understanding, that, uh, that, um, that happened basically when you had these border de redeployments, when Chad, Chad government decided to withdraw border forces in order to harden strategic towns. I think into that security vacuum. Uh, along with that security vacuum, there came just a total impunity. You were free, if you were a militia group, to cross into um, Chad and do what you will. Um, and you know, a crucial part of that also is that um, the on the other side of Chad border is West Darfur, and West Darfur is a place where um, the government of Sudan and its allied paramilitary proxies really consolidated military control pretty well, right? So they had, were they, the, the government of, of Sudan and its proxies were able to um, uh, basically eliminate most armed opposition, especially along the Chad Sudan border in West Darfur. And also you had, so you had large percentage of the population in these areas in IDP and to place displaced person camps. So what that meant was that the militia groups, these militia groups that had been um, doing the same kinds of activities in Darfur, raiding, stealing cattle, suddenly with the consolidation of control and with the uh, relocation of large percentage of the population to displaced person camps, suddenly they, they had some pickings. There was not the same opportunities for theft and, you know, they, they, and what had become a wartime economy, economy of pillage. But, on the other side of the Chad Sudan border, there was there were plenty of opportunities, and uh, so you, we started to see that kind of uh, these incursions, um, end of 2005, beginning of 2006, and uh, they uh, continued from there. Now, in terms of the motivation, 
I can't pretend to know what's in the mind of uh, you know uh, these militia leaders or you know any these members of these militias. I, I can see what appears. I can I can I can attempt to uh, hypothesize based on my findings in the field when I go to villages in eastern Chad that have been attacked and they report almost universally that they um, that those who attacked them took their cattle. Well, you know it stands to reason that theft was a motive for that attack. Now, subsequently, you know, that was early in 2006, subsequently there have been attacks that have not been accompanied by theft, where they have come, where militias have come to villages full of civilians, these are not military targets, and burned villages, uh, burned houses, killed people, raped women, and have not stolen cattle. That's a different pattern of violence, and that suggests that there's a different motivation. But unfortunately, I don't know what the motivation is. Um, do you have any idea of what direction you see this taking? I mean, is it getting worse? Are there, is there any changes? Yeah, there's, uh, there, there, there are changes, and the, the changes, I think, are um, making it worse. So one of the things is the, um, the, the supply of weapons, automatic weapons, um, into uh, communities, into civilian hands, right? And this you know, interestingly, you know, is, is happening um, with both Arab and non-Arab ethnic groups. And how does that happen? Well, one way I know that it happens, that there, there could be other ways, is that the Chadian government is not monolithic. So if you might have one member of government who is concerned about non-Arab civilians in eastern Chad and might find a way to get weapons into their hands, but you also might have an Arab member of government who might be concerned about Arab civilians in Eastern Chad and might find a way to get weapons into their hands. So you, you have a government that is very prone to fragmentation, that is where there's a lot of access to weapons. And so that phenomenon of weapons into civilians, uh, into civilian communities, very dangerous. And uh, that's a new development. And that does not bode well for the future of communal, communal relations. Now, additionally, there is a major demographic shift, especially in this area of southeastern Chad, where there's been so much violence, um, where you have now 140,000 displaced persons in a small area of southeastern Chad, and you have perhaps 30, 35,000 Sudanese refugees in the same area. So that's a, that, those, the, the, you know, the, the refugees have been there since 2003, the displaced persons have been there since the beginning of 2006, so it's a very sudden shift in a very delicate area. Where you, uh, you know, there's uh, particularly in terms of access to water. Now, in the rainy season, there's water everywhere. In the dry season, there isn't water everywhere. So everybody has to, you know, everyone in the area, if they want water, they have to go to the same place. So when you have an additional 140,000 people, Chadians, and an additional 30, 35,000 Sudanese refugees in a small area, all of a sudden you're going to have. The, 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 the problem of water is a bigger problem, and uh, that, uh, that uh, also is a new development that is not good for uh, communal relations, prospects for peace.